Father God, indeed, you are our rock of ages. You are the solid rock on which our faith is built, on which our lives are supported, dear Lord. May we cling to you. May we put our faith in you in all things. As we gather this morning, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that we are part of a biblical church that truly teaches your word and all of the world word and does not pervert it. Continue to be with us. Continue to give us your guidance and direction, even though the world would direct us otherwise, dear Lord. May we again always build our faith, build our trust, build our lives on that solid rock. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Bless us and bless your word as we share in it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And good morning. Good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord and to have each one here. Uh, don't see any guests. Do we have any visitors today? It is good to have each one here. We thank the Lord for our time together. I uh, want to share just a, a few announcements quickly. Uh, do make note of, of all of the announcements. There's a lot, a lot coming up in the next several weeks, and we uh, want to be sure that you don't miss anything. Uh, this week, Pastor Scott will be away for the first part of the week at a, at a conference, and so there will be no Wednesday Bible study, uh, but the Bible studies will resume on Thursday evening. Uh, the youth Bible study will be at 5.30. Uh, the mobile clothes bank is, is going to be here Thursday evening as well at 6 p.m. And then uh, there's the Facebook Live online Bible study uh, on Thursday evening at 7. So don't forget those. Also, uh, Friday afternoon, uh, Pastor Scott will be speaking out at Life Care Center in the afternoon. So keep him in prayer for that as he goes out there. Uh, Saturday, Saturday evening is Mom's Night Out. And yes. Barbara. Yes. Share I with will uh, send this around again because some of you may have had to think about it through the week. Uh, and also, I just want to bring to your attention uh, we send this around just sort of to help us get an idea of how many we're serving. But you're always welcome. The door is always welcome whether you've signed up or not. Uh, we plan to have a very good evening. Uh, I am uh, talking in the place and for uh, Lene. She may be the one that, if you haven't signed up, may be calling you uh, to see if you can either help or if you would like to attend. So I let this go. We always have a good time. It's just a good time of fine fellowship among the ladies. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Barbara. And again, as that comes around, if uh, you're planning to attend, we need to count, but we also need to have an idea of how many of uh, the gentlemen uh, that are here will be able to come out and help serve uh, and clean up, too. We learned last week that's part of the job is cleaning up afterwards and put the kitchen back together. Uh, so, again, that's this Saturday evening. Uh, it should be a good time of, of fun, and I know they're going to have a good program and uh, good food to share. Uh, and there's Lene. I don't know if she has anything else she wanted to say. Or the list is coming around, so please sign up. Uh, again, that's Saturday evening. Uh, looking forward next Sunday, Pastor Scott will be speaking out of Timberview in the afternoon. Uh, looking down the road uh, here in a couple of weeks, two weeks, we have Friend Day. And so we encourage you to try to be here for that and also invite friends, family, uh, anyone that, uh, that you'd like to invite to come and, and enjoy the, the time of, of worship and fellowship. Uh, we have uh, good music coming and looking forward uh, to that. Uh, the service will begin at 1030. Remember that. Our service will be starting at 1030 uh, for Friend Day. That's on the 19th. Uh, those who would come for Sunday school, I think some of the, uh, the youth teachers will be having a lesson. Uh, most likely our music will be setting up and our time will be limited, so we're not planning to have the adult uh, lesson up here. Uh, we may try to share some scripture together or, or what have you uh, that, that we can. So we will be here at 10 o'clock, but uh, not sure which classes will be held and which will not at this time. Uh, so again, that's two weeks from today. 
Uh, don't forget there's a fellowship meal following, so bring something to share and plan to stay for fellowship and uh, enjoying our friends, uh, whether they're part of the church or whether there are others that we invite to attend with us. Uh, we'll be sharing that uh, fellowship meal together following the worship time. And then Carla shared that there are also, uh, um, she was trying to keep me straight back there. I need that. I need that. But in the afternoon, she's planning to, uh, anybody that has interest, to have a softball boat game over at the uh, park uh, following lunch. So uh, just come back and make it a full afternoon. And uh, you might want to come dress that you can play some softball or have a change of clothes if you'd rather uh, for the time afterwards. So uh, a good day of a fun fellowship and enjoying being together with uh, with friends. So again, that's uh, in two weeks on the 19th. Uh, then on the 21st, which is a Tuesday, uh, there will be the book club in the evening at 6 p.m. And I think Lene needs to count today, is that right? Yes. Uh, we need to let the, uh, the lady who is preparing the meal uh, know how many to expect, and so she needs to get that word to her. So if you know that you're you're attending, or are pretty sure you're going to attend, let Lene know so that she can get that count to the caterer. And uh, the information, the address for it, is in the note somewhere here. Not on the. It's here somewhere. Book club on the back. Uh, the address is there. The nicely home at uh, Cooks Creek Road. Uh, so the address is there where uh, they will be holding it, and so it should be a, another good time of fellowship and getting out and eating and uh, enjoying uh, each other's company with friends. Uh, those are the announcements that I had. Also, there's one that uh, we have a card from uh, WRE. It says... Uh, Christian education, employment opportunity, <coughs> weekday religious education needs to hire a Bible teacher for John C. Myers Elementary School in Broadway. This is a part-time paid position for classes held during school hours two days a week. If you're interested, uh, there's a phone number here. I will put this on the bulletin board so you can get the information. The phone number, if you want to jot it down, is 540-438-438. 9997 438 9997 or you can email wre rock1929 at gmail.com. Again, we'll put this on the bulletin board uh, if you're interested in contacting them and learning more about that position. Are there any other announcements anyone would like to share at this time? All right, we'll take a moment and uh, greet one another. Uh, and then we'll return for the chorus, The Lord is My Light. Amen. Hey. 
thank you for the opportunity to be in your house again this morning. We would ask that you would bless everybody here. Bless those that have to give. Bless those that do not. Or just bless those that are missing, whatever the reasons may be, and lead them back to us. Lord, let us all be more faithful to thee and go out and tell others about thee. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
an update on my granddaughter. Okay, thank you. Um, she's improving. Uh, Donna Marie is improving, uh, and she continues to uh, meet certain protocols, but there are still some protocols she has not yet met. So they still have her in the NICU until uh, she has met those particular protocols that they're looking for in order to release her. So uh, keep breaking actually in your prayers. Uh, the, the baby is doing very well though. I mean, you know, as far as expectations go, we haven't seen any negative. It's all been improvements. Thank you for, for asking. I appreciate that. Anything else? Yeah, yes. Our, oh. our kids texted this morning and asked that we remember their friends and co-workers who were having health issues. One's name is Annette and the other is Trish. Okay. <coughs> Annette and Trish having health issues. Let's keep them in our prayers. Anything else? Yes. Very good. Well, praise the Lord, Nina. We're, we're glad with you. Yeah. All right. Anything else? More like that, maybe. Okay. Well, Pete Paul called me and she said that the, the prickles are different, too strong, but the things are already dissolved in the stomach. But they're trying to get the doses that they're giving her, you know, the regulated, but she is, they are strength. And then thanks for the brain and stuff. All right. Thank you for the update on Gene. Yeah, we want to keep Gene Falk in our prayers, definitely. Anything else? All right, let's look to the Lord. We come before you, mighty God, who sits enthroned in heaven, at whose right hand is our Savior, Jesus Christ. You've caused your Holy Spirit to dwell within us, Lord, and this is why we have fellowship with you. This is why we know you. And we look about us, Lord, at the trends that are going on around us, and oh, it seems so dark, Lord, but oh, does a candle ever burn bright in the darkness? God, I pray that you would help our candles to burn so brightly that people would want to just warm themselves in the presence of of the gospel that we preach. I pray, Father, for our converted brothers and sisters that have tried their hardest to stay the test of time and events with the United Methodists and are now trying to figure out what to do. I pray, Lord, you give them wisdom if resources are needed, I pray, Father, that you would supply them with resources. But I pray, Father, that every church that wishes to remain biblical would be enabled by you to do the very thing they wish to do. And I pray, Father, that you would be with the individuals who are grieving because of what their denomination has done. I pray, Father, that you would be with those that are on our prayer list. We have many that are struggling with cancer, and Jack Folk and Jean Folk also are uh, prominent in that list. For We see them every week, and we are, are uh, with them in heart and with them in prayer. For we love them, and we want them to do well. Pray for their families, Lord, we pray for. Uh, those that are relatives and friends who are struggling with cancer as well. And we think of, of many, Lord, that even run through the mind even now. And I pray, God, that your hand would be with them. I pray, Father, for those that are struggling with other health issues, that, God, you would be gracious and merciful unto them. And I pray, Father, that you would be with those that are dealing with relationship issues right now. We pray, Father, that you give them wisdom in the midst of all of that. 
And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to grow and to prosper the gospel in those relationships. Thank you, Lord, for new babies. Thank you, Lord, for new family members. Opportunities for us to have a positive impact on these developing lives. We ask God that you would help us to do just that. We ask, Lord, your hand upon those that are in the military and those that are in the emergency services. Thank you for them, those, Lord, that are in medical and educational services and those, Lord, that are in business around us. God, give us wisdom. Give us an atmosphere of trust and truth. Be with our missionaries, Lord, as they bring the gospel forward. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. not a coordinated <coughs> message, but it happens to come at a time when we uh, probably really needed to hear it. We're going to start at uh, Genesis chapter 19, verses 15 to 22 for our text, and then we'll move from there. Starting up at uh, verse 15. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. And when he hesitated, the men grabbed his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. For the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness <coughs> to me in sparing my life, but I can't flee. To the mountains, this disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, here's a town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It's very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to him, Very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zoar. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Oh, I guess I've already hit my mark there. That's good. I'm a fast reader and they gave me some credit for it. How about that? Okay, now I told you that there was one of the five cities that didn't burn, and that's Zoar. Um, I, uh, I, if you go on YouTube ever, uh, look up Expedition Bible. It is a narco archaeological channel. Uh, the, the, the archaeologist that presents the information there, uh, he teaches at Shepherd's Theological Seminary down in North Carolina. Um, very reputable seminary. And this guy nails things right on the button. It is so cool to see the the expeditions and the and the excavation sites and all of this. And he has one of his uh, one of his videos that talks about the city that didn't burn. And he shows you archaeologically every other the site of the other four cities: uh, Adma, Zeboim, Sodom, Gomorrah. They all have a layer of ash in the, uh, in the towel as they're going down through the towel. And, and there's a layer of ash, but not with Zoar. 
not with Zoar. No layer of ash. Now this is archaeological proof of what we just read here. Now also, um, you'll find that in that in that valley, uh, there are sulfur balls in the uh, in the in the dirt, buried in the dirt, all over the place. Little balls of sulfur. You can to this day you can pick one up, light it on fire, and it'll melt right before you. Um, these were these are the sulfur balls that fell. This is not typical of that area. Um, in fact, they're not found anywhere up in the mountains. They're found down in the plain around the, the brim of the Dead Sea, uh, especially on the side where the five cities were. So um, archaeology certainly proves what we're talking about today indeed did happen, exactly as it said that it would happen. And that's a side note that you can do with whatever you would like. I want to talk about, first of all, the fact that it didn't just take a warning. Okay? There was a warning. The warning was, get out of the city because of the destruction that is about to come. And the Bible says that when Lot hesitated, they literally reached out, grabbed him and his family, and it says led them out of the city, but the way I see it in my mind's eye is drug them out of the city. Um, in other words, I see, I, I see four people being led, but kind of back here, being pulled along and kind of, you know, stumbling as they try to avoid being pulled. That's what I see in my mind's eye. Do it with you as you will. But in the scripture in Philippians 2.13, we see this, that God works in us both to will and to act. So what does this mean in light of what we see here? An example of what this passage in Philippians is talking about. If somebody comes to you and tells you flee because the city is about to be destroyed, your natural thought is if somebody told me that and they were reputable, such as angels who had just inflicted a bunch of crazy people with blindness, I would think I would take that pretty serious and just go. But they didn't want to go. They had no will to follow the instructions. Clear as they were, they had no will to leave behind this city of destruction. No will. So, Whose will got them out of the city? Not Lot's will, not his wife's will, not his daughter's will. It was the will of the angels. The angels of God had the will to do this, and they grabbed them by the hands, one of them grabbing the hands of his two daughters, the other one grabbing the hands of Lot and his wife, and those two angels pulled these people out of the city. It was the angels of God that had the will. It was the angels of God that acted upon the will of God. And so here we have a, a prime example of what Paul is talking about in Philippians 2.13. Any reasonable person, having just seen a horde of people gone blind all at once, simply by the motion of an angel, and then doesn't have the clarity of mind and of will to run from the city when they're told by those same people to run. Folks, this is exactly what happens every single day. When we tell people to flee from sin, the Bible says flee from youthful lusts. The Bible says flee from sexual immorality. Every other thing that people do, every other sin they commit, they commit 
uh, outside their body, but sexual immorality is something that happens inside of you, and you can never, ever escape it. Once you have committed sexual immorality, you can't go back. It will stay with you for the rest of your life. Now, does that mean that a person can't be saved if they've committed sexual immorality? That's not what this means. What it means is it will always be here, and it will always be here. And the Bible tells you to flee from it. But what do people sitting in churches everywhere do when they hear flee from sexual immorality? They become more curious about it. And so they immediately, it's like Paul said about covetousness. He said, I wouldn't know, have known what the law was except that the law said don't covet. And when it said don't covet, suddenly the flesh, seizing the opportunity, created in me every kind of covetous desire. Now it's the same thing when God says flee. When he says flee from destruction. When he says get out of there. Save yourself. When that happens, folks, the very thing that comes up in us is not, I'd better flee. But it's, why should I flee? Why should I run? Why should I worry? And all of a sudden, we see what God means when he says he must work in us both to will and to act. We need to see sin the way God sees it. Now, the Bible says that Lot was a righteous man. This is in Peter's letters. It says that Lot was a righteous man and his soul was irritated every day by what he saw around him. But when the time came for him to leave, we see in the scripture that he just didn't have the will. So, we need to see sin the way God sees it. So let me turn to the book of Romans with you, chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 10. And then down through verse 18. Romans chapter 3, verses 10, down through 18. They recognized him... Uh, oh, that's Acts, okay. Uh, Romans, how about the work? I thought it was there. I got so excited. Oh, well. Verse 10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. This is not the starting point, folks. This is always. There is no one righteous, not even one. The Bible says that there is not a righteous man on all the earth who always does what is right and never sins. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. You say, well, there's all kinds of people out there seeking God. And you're right or the scripture is right? Which one is right? No one who seeks God. People aren't looking for God. They're looking for peace. They're looking for a way out. They're looking for some kind of, of abs absolution for their sins, but they're not seeking after God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Their throats are an open grave. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God 
before their eyes. So the category of all of these people is that there is none righteous, no, not one. And then Paul begins to explain in detail what that means. And Paul paints a picture here in Romans of a depravity that has so completely overtaken men that they don't even do good, they've become worthless, and they don't even seek after God. That that is the starting point. This is not Paul lamenting or the uh, prophets that he's quoting lamenting. This is not a lament. This is a statement of fact so that we understand how completely excluded from holiness we really are. So that we understand how desperately we need to flee from destruction. So that we don't do as Lot did and sit there and try and figure out why or what or whatever was on his mind because he didn't flee when he was told to flee. He had to be grabbed. He had to be, in a sense, drug out of the city. The Bible there said lead. I would, again, I just I picture in my mind that he's being pulled out of the city. And then... It's hard for us to see home as something to flee from. So this also accounts for the resistance of Lot. First of all, that he doesn't see sin the way God sees it. Second of all, that he doesn't see home as something to flee from. But look what it says in verse 13 through 16 of Hebrews 11. All of these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, but only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Now, foreigners and strangers on earth don't have a home. They're foreigners and strangers. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. So people looking for a country don't have a home. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. So the home that we're looking for is a home not found on earth. It's found in heaven. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So there is a city that is prepared. It is God that has prepared it. And those of us who have been converted no longer look at this world as our home. But rather instead, a tabernacle, a tent. And the Bible calls this tabernacle of our body or this tent of our body in 1 Corinthians 15 that when this is shed, a glorious future awaits us. This body that I have, this flesh I have, my mind, my soul, my body, it's the last vestige of Adam's curse. Everything else is being changed. I was dead, but now I live. I was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. And God has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. The cornerstone, Jesus, is upon whom I have been built. Peter says, like living stones being built upon that cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected. I'm being built upon that stone. Folks, we have to change our view of things. Biblically, we need to look at this world. Not humanly. 
biblically. Not the way we've always looked at it. We have to look at, at this world as an 80 year period of time or so, depending on how gracious God is to you in life. We have to look at this as a short time period in comparison with eternity through which we must suffer in order to get to the glory and the majesty that awaits us. Ladies that have had babies, you know that the expectation of having that baby is the most wonderful expectation. You can feel the baby growing. You can feel the baby moving. You dream about all that will be when the baby is born. And then you hit that ninth month. And it's the longest month. It's a month that lasts for what? Five years? Something like that, I think. That ninth month. Where you are just begging people, please get this thing out of me. It is the biggest travail that you ever go through. This is why God compares that travail of that ninth month he compares that with the church. The church is like for the 80 years or so of your individual life, your life is like God in labor, earth in labor, all creation in labor to bring forth a glorified version of you. And the comparison in the scripture is so particular that we can understand, based upon the travail of a mother, how it is that you and I must face great suffering and pain before we are delivered into the heavenly from which there will never be dying or perishing, leaving or crying or tears. And until that day, folks, we are certainly, certainly facing the troubles that God said we would. We tend to pick the familiar over the divine, and this is why we don't flee. Looking at Mark 7. And uh, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 9. Mark 7, verses 5 through 9. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it's written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have to let go. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And then he continued. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Lot says to the angels, look, 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 there's a small city over there, Zoar. It's at the outskirts of the rest of the cities. I can make it there. It's a very small city, isn't it? You don't have to destroy that one. The angels say, fine, fine. You can go to Zoar. We won't destroy that one. But you've got to go, and you've got to go now. Zoar, it's still one of the cities. It's still in the plain. Remember, this plain at this time is green, grassy, fertile. The Dead Sea has fish in it. 
it is it, it is a wonderful area to live in. It's beautiful. Why would you want to leave such a glorious and gorgeous home? So I'll tell you why. You don't want me to stay in Sodom. I won't stay in Sodom. But can I at least go to Zohar? It's just a little city. A lot probably new people in Zohar. Probably. We don't know, but probably. And so they're told they can go to Zohar. Now, folks, this is what you and I always do. When God has finally convinced us with information and with all of the, uh, the convictions that uh, he can muster. And then we say, look, I don't want to leave behind my home. So how about if I can have just a small piece of my home? This little city over here, just a little. It's, I, I just, I, I don't want to leave the plane. It's, it's right there. It's just a little city. It's a one. So we say to God, okay, you've convinced me, you've convicted me. I agree, I agree, I got to do something. And so instead of being converted, you get religion. And when you get religion, what happens is you turn out to be like these Pharisees. You set aside the commands of God for your own traditions. What has happened in the United Methodist Church this weekend, folks, is heartbreaking. But it's easy to understand. You see, they care about these relationships between people. And they will make any sacrifice they have to make to keep the relationships they have with other people, including sacrificing the truth and the Word of God. Now it's not just them, it's just that they're the most recent and the worst example that we have right now. The difference between them and a biblical church is we care about our relationship with God. And we will make any sacrifice to keep that relationship. And the Bible says this truly, anyone who does not hate father or mother, brother or sister, yes, even their own life, cannot be my disciple. If you do not give up everything you have, you cannot be my disciple. Folks, here we are looking at Lot, and he's being told, give up everything you have, flee to the mountains. And Lot says, if I try that, I may get caught, but there's Zohar. I can keep a little bit, can't I? Do I really have to leave behind the life I've always known? Can't I keep a piece of it? And so we keep that peace in religion. We hide our hearts in religion. And we think to ourselves, I've satisfied God, and I still have what I want. And what a great compromise religion is between God's demands and my desires. And yet the scripture tells me this, that God only gives me the desires of my heart when I delight myself in Him. And so as religion has gone on, what we've done is we've kind of circumvented everything and we've said that man is in the center of the universe and God wants to help man. But the scripture says, no, Christ is in the center of the universe. And he brings men into his orbit. Men don't even enter his orbit by their own will. Because there's no one who is righteous, no one who does good, no one who seeks after God. They've become altogether worthless. The testimony of the scripture, the testimony that we ignore and ignore and ignore. Because it doesn't fit with our religion. Next. 
In choosing familiar over the divine, we choose inventiveness over obedience. In Psalm 99, verses 5 through 9, I direct your attention there, of course. Verses 5 through 9. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them from the pillar of cloud. They kept his statutes and the decrees he gave them. The Lord our God, you answered them. You were to Israel a forgiving God, though you took vengeance on their inventions. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Now, there's a theme at the beginning and at the end of that passage. And it gives you two commands, exalt the Lord and worship him. Neither of which has to, anything to do with how inventive and clever you are. And then it says that he forgave their sins but took vengeance on their inventions. God forgave the sins of Moses and Aaron and Samuel and all of that. He forgave all of their sins. And they did sin. And he took vengeance on their invention. When Moses didn't obey God, but struck the rocket, that was an invention. God still gave water to the people. But he took away Moses' privilege to enter into the promised land because of it. Aaron's sins were forgiven him, even though he had designed a golden calf to represent God for the people to worship. And he had led them into revelry. And yet, his sins were forgiven him. And God buried Aaron. And Moses. And Aaron was mourned. Moses was hidden from the people. These were fellows that when they obeyed God, God was happy with them. But when they invented what to do, God was angry with them. It's not just them. How did Gideon win his battle? Well, he didn't. God chose Gideon. Gideon didn't choose God. Gideon chose 32,000 men. God chose 300. Gideon didn't know what in the world he was going to do, but God told him what to do. And as long as Gideon obeyed God, things were fine. It's that way with every story in the Bible. I can go through the whole scripture. But the thing is, we're, we're more at ease with our ideas. We don't have to wait for our ideas. Do you realize, folks, that the biggest part of obedience is waiting on the Lord? The biggest part of obedience is not doing anything active until God tells you what to do. It's sitting still while everything seems to be crumbling around you and sticking with your daily disciplines, Bible study, prayer, and sharing your testimony. Sticking with those daily disciplines the whole time and enduring until God finally says, okay, now, act. And God, with the will, and God, with the ability to act, steps in. Then we also have to remember that in choosing the familiar over the divine, we have a tendency to choose the common over the holy. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 26, Ezekiel 22, verse 26. Let's 
scripture says here, her priests do violence to my law and profane my holy things. They do not distinguish between the holy and the common. They teach that there is no difference between the unclean and the clean, and they shut their eyes to the keeping of my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. Okay, so what does this mean? The word profaned here means to make something commonplace. That's what the word profaned means, to make something commonplace. So what God is saying in essence is that he's holy, he's not common. We have a tendency to make him common. Many are on Facebook and some just are shared from pulpits. Even this morning probably there are pulpits that are sharing Jesus jokes and God jokes. Where God is some kind of a sarcastic person and Jesus is some kind of a, of a silly thing. And everybody giggles and giggles because they see the humor in it. And meanwhile, God is made common. God is made every day. He's not held up as holy. Folks, listen to me. God is holy. He, that means that you can never, ever, 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 no matter how much you try, you can never refine yourself enough to be as holy as he is. He is so separate from you. He is so other than you. And that leaves you completely in the dust. The Bible says for you to remember this, that you are but dust. That you're like the grass that grows today and by evening is scorched by the sun and withers away. To take God and to bring him down out of heaven and to throw muck on him. To try and make him relatable. This is why denominations, whole denominations, are fleeing the scriptures. Because they do not make any distinction between the holy and the common. The sanctuaries in many churches these days... They're not sanctuaries. They're multi-purpose rooms. And the multi-purpose room has detachable chairs and things. Not against chairs. Wonderful. Great. You have some in the back. A lot of people like them. That's not what I'm talking about. But they have detachable chairs for a reason. Because when service is over, they can stack the chairs, move them into a room, pull down the basketball hoop, and start playing basketball in the very same sanctuary that they were just worshiping a holy God. And it turns into nothing. And then you wonder why your kids grow up and they leave church and they go wandering off. There's no distinction between the holy and the common. God is holy. And he is to be honored above all men. He is to be honored above all of the inventions of men. <coughs> and no matter how you feel about how unrelatable God may be to you, God is still holy. And we cannot, cannot Take those things which have been set aside as sacrosanct to him and turn them into romper rooms. I would that we had so many people clamoring to know the gospel that this sanctuary were open every day, full of people seeking the word, and I'm trusting God for a revival, that it will come. And that day will come, and even if we only know it for a season, that we will still have known it. <clears throat> the 
danger is that we're going to be consumed by iniquity. So what happens? First of all, the fertile becomes desolate. We haven't talked about the destruction of Sodom in detail, but this is what will happen. Those sulfur balls will fall on them from the sky. The Bible doesn't say from where. We don't know that there's an active volcano nearby, so we don't know where God got these balls of sulfur. But they fell. And everything that they hit, they melted onto it and burned it like napalm. The cities were ruined. The grass was burned. The salt in the ground was boiled out of the ground and settled into the Dead Sea and killed all the fish. Flee from destruction, God says. Flee from destruction. You say, let me see the destruction first, and then I'll decide whether it's worth fleeing from. If God says flee, flee. Run. Hightail it out of there. The next thing we see here is the pleasant becomes detestable. <clears throat> no one can live in the Dead Sea plain. There's nothing there. Maybe the scraggly bits of a bush that has been fighting with all of its might to survive, but rocks, sand, ash, and a sea that can't sustain life. The pleasant becomes detestable when the destruction of God comes in. Then, last of all, judgment becomes manifest. What will happen? What will happen to us if at least one church or one denomination doesn't rise up and say no? No. We will flee. We will not flee to Zoar and take refuge in religion. No, we will flee to the mountains as we were told. Side note, Lot eventually winds up in the mountains anyway. Well, folks, if I've been passionate and a little bit forceful today, and that has put you off, I'm sorry that it put you off. Please understand my passion. It is at least, for my part, well placed. I do love you. I do love our community. I do so badly want to see the hand of God at work among our neighbors and friends and family. I want them saved. So that's where I leave you today. And we won't pick up with this series except for one sermon in June because we've got so much going on for Mother's Day, Father's Day, Friends Day, Memorial Day. It's a, it's a time of holidays. So hang on to the next one. But in the meantime, enjoy your Mother's Day sermons and, and uh, Friends Day gathering. It's going to be very fun. And uh, you probably need a break from this kind of preaching for a little bit anyway. <laughs> well, let's have the uh, response to the, the, the message. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, 
and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Stand and sing 387. 
somebody. 